this session is governance and compliance, and it's probably a good session to, to finish on because there's so much today about scams and problems and some of the solutions that are there. But overpinning that, you know, is always a, an organization's governance and compliance programs to, to attest that they're actually doing the things they say they do. Um, so in this session, uh, I'm sure you all know these people, but we've got Johnny Pirovich, we've got Jamie Lumsden, we've got Simon Tesipas, and Michael Basina. So what I'd like to do is let each one of them introduce themselves and give you a couple of minutes on their what they've been working on, what they do in, in this space. And uh, then we'll jump to some questions and maybe Michael will start with you. Thanks so much, Gordon. And thanks everyone for putting in the hard yards of a really excellent um, conference today. Really appreciate being here. Um, I, people know generally know who I am. I head up the blockchain group at Piper Alderman. I'm also chair of Blockchain Australia. So we work closely uh, in my practice and also with members who are um, dealing with DAO issues, uh, advising around how governance can be set up, what structures can be looked at, how smart contracts can be interpreted against the contractual frameworks and other regulatory issues that come up in the blockchain space, which keeps be busy and up late at night thinking about things. So, and there's lots of really excellent practitioners like some of the panel here today that I get to discuss these issues with as well. So I'm really looking forward to our, our discussion today and hopefully everyone will, will be a little bit more enlightened by the end of it, or at least know some of the issues that, that they need to think about. Who's next, Gordon? I have to think thing, Johnny. Uh, Johnny, why don't you go next? We'll just go on the line. Sure, hi everyone, thanks for having me. Joni Pirovich, the principal and founder of Blockchain and Digital Assets Services Plus Law, or Bedazzle Short. I have recently been engaged by some international organisations to further the adoption of uh, the DAO model law written by Koala, the Coalition of Automated Legal Applications. And we've had some recent success in Utah, uh, negotiating with a number of other governments to follow. And a related sort of blockchain standards organization called DAOSTAR, where that, that's the, the data standards that accompany, uh, if you could call the Koala DAO model law, the plain language version of, of standards that we think DAOs should adopt. So um, yeah, data standards and plain language standards is my vibe and uh, plus one to all of the practical and legal implementation that Michael was mentioning around smart contracts, governance arrangements, down compliance, basically. And Jamie? Thanks, Gordon. Uh, so I'm Jamie Lumsden, a partner in the funds and financial services practice at Hamilton Lock. Uh, the cryptocurrency practice sits within uh, my remit. Uh, so we spend a lot of time advising um, crypto businesses, uh, especially um, startups on how the financial services regulation as it stands now um, applies to their business. Uh, of course, with all of the incoming consultation and legislation that's under discussion at the moment, that also includes advising uh, those clients on token mapping and subsequent submissions that'll be made to Treasury, um, as well as making our own submissions um, and supporting other businesses. Great, thanks, Jeremy. And Simon? Simon, I think you're on mute. Thanks, Gordon. Uh, I'm a director at Madison Brands and Lawyers. We typically assist our clients, uh, a variety of different clients in the blockchain space, um, mostly startups, of course, uh, the variety, including developments up to uh, digital currency exchanges. Um, a, a lot of our work varies in general commercial, uh, particularly at the fundamental level of structuring and then helping with ongoing compliance. Um, we're finding a lot of our work in um, dealing with uh, uh, projects in social identity and community engagement at the moment. Great, thanks, Simon. Um, why don't we just start with with the, the first question, which I, and just maybe put a little bit of of context around it, because governance is a very big word. And maybe let's 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 if you guys can frame your answers, and we'll think about governance from both at a corporate level. How do they know that they're doing the right thing? And then what are those things they should be thinking about, right? So they're, they're both the, how do I know my company doing what they should be doing and what should they be doing? And maybe maybe we'll start that one with Joni with you and, and uh, let you 
uh, go for a few minutes. Sure, I'll try to keep it brief because we can all talk for days on this one. <laughs> but um, with a traditional company structure, there are obviously legal frameworks that tell you if you have this size of a company, um, you don't need to produce annual financial statements in, according with, in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. Or if you do have more than 50 employees uh, or this many shareholders, then, then you're subject to higher and more onerous standards of reporting, both financial as well as non-financial. And increasingly, there's going to be more obligations on the non-financial things as we see ESG environment, social and governance uh, initiatives find their way through into both international or, or foreign and Australian legal requirements. So a company has got reporting obligations, it's got compliance obligations, and it typically assigns the responsibilities to comply with those things to its directors and its officers. And we all probably know about directors' duties of loyalty, good faith, uh, and so forth, but a director and an officer, each of them are able to delegate the fulfillment or, or going ahead with actions that fulfill their responsibilities. But the director or the officer is still ultimately responsible for proper compliance with whatever the obligation is. So companies, maybe they do a good job of this, maybe they do a bad job. We see um, the bad jobs, see, uh, you know, through, through the court actions where um, directors haven't fulfilled their duties and people have suffered harm as a result. So that's where, um, despite the limited liability of a company, the director or directors may be pursued for personal liability because they weren't performing their jobs reasonably or, or with the skills that would have been expected of a reasonable person in that same position. But with DAOs and these natively technology organisations, we don't have that same framework, or at least if it does apply, it's not clear how it applies in the same way as it would with a traditional company organisation. And just to give one example of this and, and why the koala DAO model law has taken the approach it has is that we one, one of the articles is that there are no implied fiduciary duties of people that contribute or that participate in a DAO. And this is because you've got this decentralization of governance interactions, but not necessarily governance. So where there is a strategy proposal that's put up or you know a, a, that a second or a third security audit needs to happen in relation to a protocol before it's deployed, uh, on a blockchain, you'll have maybe many people, many thousands or sometimes many hundreds of thousands of people stating their sentiment or expressing a view. And there's not one director or typically even a council that is responsible for collating what that means for the DAO as if it was a traditional corporate entity or taking on the responsibility that a director typically would and nor are they necessarily remunerated uh, in the same way that directors and officers that do take on that legal risk and the responsibility are. So, I mean, sometimes they're remunerated much better, but we all know that tokens are volatile and I'm not getting any into any speculation here. So the, the lack of um, structure and accountability is both a pro and a con because we want to allow the experimental freedom of what we code, what, what we put into code uh, to get us to a state of both real-time compliance with the outcomes that regulation seeks to achieve, but also real-time accountability for not necessarily the identities involved, but all of the pseudonyms and the reputation of those pseudonyms that have contributed to those governance interactions. And so this paradigm that we're in of having many thousands of eyes upon this open source and public good of an organization or a particular protocol is in theory supposed to um, hypothesize that it can produce better, more reliable and more robust outcomes than what we can achieve with simply like one director 
responsible for supervising all of the inputs that lead into, um, for example, a strategy or a new product offering. Uh, and, and there are arguments either ways, because traditional corporates will say we have great layers of governance and risk frameworks, and there's a process that we all go through before a product is launched. But we still see that there's consumer harm. Not a lot of mums and dads understand standard form contracts. We've got more consumer actions and more onerous unfair contract um, provision laws coming out. And people are pulling their hair out saying, can't you just make it simpler? And at the end of the day, what we're trying to do here with the blockchain technology and, and programmability is real-time compliance that makes things more transparent and simpler for the people that are interacting with them. Hopefully that's enough of a context to get people going. Uh, Joni, I'm going to have to listen to that several times to just <laughs> pick apart all the concepts you've got, right? As with all our conversations, I prefer to record them than, than kind of get to the, because you leave so many nuggets there for that we can all think about. Michael, maybe I'll just jump to you and just twist it a little bit, because we, if we have a DAO and we have all these projects out there, and now I'm a company in Australia, whether that's an exchange, an asset manager, whoever, how do I need to think about governance when I'm interacting with these uh, decentralized networks and hubs, and what should I be doing? Maybe well, that's a bit of a bit. <laughs> no, fair enough. I've always find we put on the spot. And thanks, Johnny, for that really great intro and overview of some key issues. The first question for someone who's interacting with the DAO is, from a legal perspective, what am I interacting with? So from a practical perspective, you can interact with them. There's many out there. They're, they have tokens. They have smart contracts that you can do things with. Um, typically for individuals who are engaging with them, they don't care about necessarily the legalities of it and say, I can do this thing, therefore I can, I can achieve a result. And a good analogy that, to that is, you don't need to care whether the corner store is owned by a trust or it's a partnership or a company. You just buy your Mars bar and you're done. Um, you pay your money and you're through. So a lot of people interact with DAOs in that way. It's simply an outcome they want to see and they treat it like a vending machine. It's automated. Who cares what's in the background? However, once it gets into um, companies and businesses that need to keep records and need to ensure they have valid and binding contracts with counterparties that they're dealing with, because as Joni mentioned, directors have obligations. That's when you start to see these friction points arise of saying, well, hang on a minute, who am I contracting with? Who's gonna be on an actual contract? So that's always a starting point is what, what is a DAO when you get into this sort of decentralized point? And I'm mindful that, you know, our topic of today being more around security to Joni's points that part of the underlying principle of DAOs is to have greater transparency, which should go to greater, greater levels of security, getting rid of siloed or hidden information. So there'll be more information available to those who are, in, who are getting into a transaction. Um, but really that key point of what is a DAO or what is a decentralized system from a legal perspective informs so much of how can a decentralized system comply with existing laws? You know, the spoiler alert is not particularly well right now. I mean, you know, so a company could use all sorts of DAO-ish things to complete their current governance. And there's quite a few registry services that are using largely permissioned blockchain systems to allow people to um, issue and track registry of shares and, and units in unit trusts and partnership interests and things like that, um, which is perfectly fine and meets normal compliance and none of the decentralization has an issue. It more becomes an issue when you move into this Taoist world of, we're not quite sure who these people are over here. Uh, and the lawyers will of course say, well, the conservative view is likely to be unincorporated association or partnership. Um, but to Joni's point, the lines are unclear because in a traditional um, partnership arrangement, everybody who's involved can be a general partner with unlimited liability. We haven't really seen any test cases as to say, well, if someone votes once on a proposal for something to happen in a DAO, do they suddenly pick up unlimited liability for everything that the DAO does, which would seem to be a bit of a crazy outcome. Um, and partnership law tr traditionally really managed par smaller partnerships that would, that would um, allow people to know what they're exposing themselves to by getting into a partnership agreement with others. Similarly, unincorporated associations have usually some kind of outline of who the executive is, who is going to really form the association and deal with members. Whereas DAOs, the, the line between what might be traditionally seen as a member or, or um, shareholder and those who are controlling um, the organization and delivering on some outcome is much more, is much, much blurrier. So that key definitional starting point is where, where I think a lot of the, a lot of the interest and attention is focused and needs to be focused for the time being, as, as Joni said, the DAO, the Koala model law um, is, uh, an attempt to try and get 
some legal personality in there and deal squarely with these issues. And it creates some other second order problems. Um, but at least we see jurisdictions putting it in place and trying to have a go so that it can be tested under an actual legal framework and then the problem's fixed as we go along because the um, it's never going to be perfect out of the gates. I'm not sure any law ever has been. That's why lawyers still have jobs. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. I, and Jamie and Simon, I'm going to throw it over to you, but I'll, I'll, we'll go Jamie first. So I'm a company in Australia. I've been operating. I've got re I mean, maybe a, a, a DCE or, an, or such, and I've got retail clients and there's been money lost in, in, in one of the investments they've made. What are we seeing in terms of the governance that would have been expected legally with those organizations, those third parties who are selling those products or making them available to customers? Have we seen any thing? Have we got, should they be worried? They can't get insurance. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so uh, my, my experience is that the degree of governance that those entities has uh, varies widely. <laughs> um, some crypto businesses are very uh, mindful corporate citizens um, and they uh, want to have protections in place for their customers uh, and they have really good frameworks. So I know of businesses that have things like investment mandates um, and, and investment management committees in the same way that your traditional financial services businesses would have, um, which make decisions and set up strategies for how they will take the crypto assets that they hold and invest them either for the benefit of themselves sometimes or for the benefit of their customers. Um, on the other hand, you will definitely find uh, businesses who wouldn't know what an investment mandate is um, and don't have any of those sort of systems and, and strategies uh, in place and don't give a whole lot of thought or consideration for um, what it might mean for their customers. Um, and some of those sorts of businesses will set up their terms and conditions to mitigate the risk for themselves to the maximum extent that they can. Um, and basically put all of the onus and the risk on the customer in the event that there's some form of loss, um, the investment goes belly up. A lot of these businesses are investing um, out the back in other crypto businesses, which of course is what happened with um, Celsius. So there was all the cross-contamination, which has flowed on and on all the way through to the latest FTX. Um, and there's not always a lot of thought for the customer who has put their crypto into that business in terms of the impact on them when they do that. Um, so yeah, that it goes from naught to a hundred. Some people are very, very good. Um, often people who have come out of traditional financial services markets and who have, um, had exposure to this in sort of traditional spaces. And then there's the other extreme where there's, there's very little consideration given to that. And, and do you have a view on what the courts, do you think the courts, let's say, reframe that. Do you think the courts yet have a view on what they would say think was acceptable are these people carrying liability they don't even understand they have i think that's an open question um asics obviously started two pieces of litigation uh one against block earner uh one against fund earn um at, at the moment there's sort of a bit of a question mark over what those platforms are uh, and i think that in both of those cases there's a reasonable chance that the court is going to conclude that it's a traditional form of financial product um, on the blockchain. Uh, and of course, if the court reaches that conclusion, we're not going to see any new evolution in terms of what governance for crypto should look like. Because uh, if we decide that block earner is a managed investment scheme, for example, or some form of derivative, the court will essentially from there conclude that, uh, well, therefore, this is regulated by financial services regulation, and you should have had all of the governance that goes with AFS licensing and those sorts of things. Uh, so that'll pretty much put a stop to the question what additional governance should crypto have? It, it will cease once we determine that's a financial product. Um, only if the court actually determines that this is not regulated as a financial product, might there maybe be some commentary on governance for crypto. But the basis on which ASIC has sort of framed their case, I'd be a little bit surprised if, if that happens either. It's more likely that we're going to see more commentary around governance for crypto that is not a financial product once we start to have regulation that is sort of crypto specific. Um, so if we pick up legislation which says, okay, well, we're going to regulate some forms of crypto platforms or tokens um, that are not financial products and we're going to have uh, an additional sort of overlay for them. And you might have then governance mandated by that legislation or you might have court cases off the back of that legislation where you get courts commenting on what that governance looks like. Um, but so long as we're sort of talking in the context of traditional financial services, which is where ASIC is playing right now, I don't think we're likely to see much come out of the courts 
in relation to governance for non-financial services crypto? I'll, I'll second that, um, what Jamie says, particularly just noting briefly that when matters come before the courts, the judges are not minded to go on wide-ranging um, commentary on matters in the, in the way you sometimes see US judges do, um, particularly at the, at the um, level of court where these actions have been brought. The court will look to decide the minimum number of, question of, facts, of fa- questions of fact sorry, necessary to dispose of the issues. So we'll be likely to have something come down which says, in this very specific set of facts, ASIC wins or ASIC loses. Um, that's what the outcome will be. And while lawyers, we will read the tea leaves on it and try and infer some matters from it. I don't think we'll see bright line guidance come out of those decisions. I think Jamie's absolutely right. It'll take um, proper governance, sorry, proper proper guidance to lead to governance coming from parliament um, or if um, ASIC or a regulator decides to issue that clearer guidance, the ATO has done a pretty good job of trying to issue guidance and try and get feedback in various ways. I know Joni has some views on that um, and has made excellent contributions along the way as some other um, lawyers have, um, possibly, Jamie as well, not so much me, I'm not great on tax, but um, that kind of view is, you know, it's very narrow what we get from the courts and it's not great to be having to deal with what governance can come out of decentralized systems from court decisions because it involves a a lot of guesswork, slightly less guesswork than we have now, but still plenty of guesswork. So maybe before we jump to Joni, um, Simon, so you're advising a startup. This sounds to me like it's evolved a lot from four or five years ago where somebody could start up in their garage that there's a, there's a lot of risk and a lot of so when you're advising a startup now like in, in say a DCE or a somebody who wants to run a small exchange or somebody who wants to do something else in Web three, as, as the landscape change and what you think they need to put in place and the cost associated with that. Uh, look, I, I think that the fundamentals uh, are the same. Certainly, the, the, the practical concepts are, are different, but I think that when we draw on on what we already know, we're finding that it's easier to to find a solution for them. So in terms of governance, um, there are a variety of practical considerations that we talk to our clients about, you know, the demographic, the geographical locations in which they want to operate, how far reaching their operations are. Um, but certainly going back to that the commentary on, on the court's influence and uh, the changing uh, uh, regulatory landscape, you know, we're finding also that the pressures are coming from the consumer level as well. Um, and it's their feedback and community engagement that's educating a lot of these operations, these organisations that are guiding them as a natural course into how they should um, uh, have best practice and, and governance, which is um, a really good thing to see, I think, having regard to the last couple of years, to see that it's just becoming organic. Mm. Well, that's good. I, I just, you, you don't, you never want to see regulation and, and, some of these issues around not being able to get insurance stop innovation, but we, you know, and that getting that balance right with protection of consumers and showing you're, you know, you're operating as a good citizen and companies always, you know, a delicate balance to face. Um, okay, Joni, I, I think I'm ready to absorb some more high powered stuff. So when you think about these, uh, if someone's thinking about building a Web3 business and a DAO, um and would you want to do it in australia would you want to do it offshore is it is there differences in the governance you'd want to have in place well australia is certainly not an attractive environment now or for the past few years actually even even in the 2017 2018 initial coin offering boom we had projects getting out of australia and at that time it was largely for tax reasons but there was still the same regulatory uncertainty that we have now that existed back then. Um, and, and we're getting more guidance now, more so from the US rather than Australia in terms of whether the use of a token for fundraising purposes turns the token itself into a security. We don't have um, very exact guidance from ASIC on that particular point. We have sort of an information map of guidance on all of the potential things that it could be. But uh, no, certainly not uh, the best place to found a DAO. But to contribute to a DAO, um, a person still has the ability to incorporate their own limited liability entity and engage with a DAO um, that may be founded in another country or may have sufficiently decentralized, you know, with a presence in a number of countries 
and then they get that limited liability protection by having their interactions with the DAO through that limited liability company. So that includes both the purchase and the dealing of tokens as a thing owned by the company. And if you can't actually have legal agreements to sign with the DAO, the person keeping their own good and real time records around what they understand of their interaction, what their potential risks are, how they're mitigating their risks. You know, all of those good governance things that take time to be thoughtful and to be written down, which um, the DAO and its, its conveners may not have necessarily turned their minds to in plain language, but it might be implied from the way in which a proposal is presented for consideration or the way in which code has been written. And, and that sort of this new technology native framework that we're dealing with, it's not just documents and plain language records. We've, we've got a combination of inputs um, across you know, social media and, and different forums to, to look to. But the other thing that I just wanna um, piggyback off the last discussion is whether something is a financial product or not. It also goes to, and, and Jamie's made this point as has Mike, whether there is a person in relation to the regulated product. And if you don't have a person, um, who do you look through to? And, and the most prominent individuals associated with a protocol or a DAO still may not be at the heart of the failure or the lack of reasonable care that's resulted in the harm. And, and so the tulip trading case that's happening over in the UK is the most informative one for this purpose at the moment, because it, tulip trading is an entity or a set of entities that are owned by Craig Wright. And there were billions of dollars worth of Bitcoin alleged to be held by those entities. And the, the substantive court case is really about tulip trading entities um, bringing all of the core developers of the Bitcoin network or the Bitcoin protocol to explain themselves in front of a judge and say, do they actually have some sort of equitable or fiduciary obligation to people that use and interact with the Bitcoin protocol to implement a software patch? Because Tulip Trading's access keys were either lost or stolen. Um, the evidence is not there to prove which way or, or the other that it happened. And so in the absence of being able to prove um, how it was lost or how it was stolen, Tulip Trading is trying to force the Bitcoin core developers to say they have a fiduciary duty um, subject to penalties or possibly even criminal like jail like penalties to implement this software patch to recover the billions of dollars of Bitcoin lost or stolen. And this, so, so if the court decides that there are fiduciary and equitable obligations, there's still a question of the effectiveness of the remedy because 16 Bitcoin core developers may not be enough to get a majority consensus around a software upgrade when it is a sufficiently decentralized network that needs at least 500 um, Bitcoin miners to implement the software patch. And so this, this is that layer one level of difficulty of fiduciary obligations and who is the person. And for a lot of those applications built on blockchain technology, which also call themselves DAOs, they may be less decentralized and there's a more easy person identified, which might be two individuals or it might be five. But that's that person question is still the critical one. And, and that's why the Koala DAO model law and, and the push to have certain minimum safeguards and conditions for legal recognition of a DAO, which also comes with a partial form of limited liability, that is to save millions if not billions of dollars of taxpayer resources all around the world fighting on this question of who is the legal person and who is responsible. For example, for, example, for compliance with regulatory reporting obligations, if, it, if the thing is a financial product. So that's a, that's a great example. And my, my worry is that somewhere in here, you will have somebody, DAOs are great and these things are interesting, 
But if we go to the masses and the masses people start to come on board, they'll always go through intermediary. They tend to go through intermediaries, right? And some intermediary in Australia is going to be stuck between decentralized systems and the consumer, and they're going to have all the liability is my worry. And and I'm not sure which of you other three would like to give me a, maybe talk about that, what your worries are, what you're advising people in that. Um, I it's think a very I valid worry, Gordon. So there's a really good example. Um, in the Voyager bankruptcy case in the US, um, a judgment just came down recently. And conveniently enough, Mr. Gary Gensler, the chairman of the SEC, also put out a fairly blistering blog um, just prior to that decision coming down. And that blog essentially says, as far as the US is concerned, crypto businesses must change their model in order to fit the existing US financial services regime or basically don't do business there. Um, and hammers the point saying, we've been very clear, we've given all sorts of clear guidance and anyone who says otherwise is wrong. Um, unfortunately for Mr. Gensler, the bankruptcy court judge has slammed them by saying the SEC has come into this um, hearing and the hearing was about whether or not Binance should be allowed to buy Voyager assets. And the judge basically said, the SEC has made all sorts of notions that things in this um, come in this bankrupt company could be securities and that Binance might be operating a financial um, regulated service, but has failed to give me any particulars or actually given me any proper basis. And in fact, the judge went so far as to say there is no guidance by the SEC whatsoever about this, despite claims to the contrary. So you have this, We, I, I certainly hope and I share your fear, and I hope we don't end up like the US, where a chairman of the securities agency is standing there declaring that everything's absolutely crystal clear, but an independent judge looking at evidence who, in fairness to him as well, grilled the SEC attorneys and said it's not their fault, they're acting on instruction, but they were given a, a chance to go away and come back with information and give further evidence and came back with nothing and had to concede the point, um, can't make a coherent argument as to why they think these things fall under these categories. And, and I certainly hope we don't end up in that position because that leads directly to the problem that you highlight that someone might say, geez, I've got these decentralized elements touching the business but we have no guidance as to whether or not they are in or out. There's nothing, there's no clear perimeter. Um, there's a signposting of what might be a problem, but might is unfortunately not something that we can risk manage for. Um, and if things like insurance aren't available and there's no pathway to regulatory compliance, which is a common cry out of America to say, it's fine if the SEC wants to say everything's a security in America, but the industry over there has said, but please give us a pathway to compliance, which isn't simply Here's the rule book, you guys figure it out. Um, and that's been a real issue over there and has seen a lot of businesses leave. So I definitely share your concern, but we do have hopes that Australia being more nimble and with a parliament and lawmakers and certainly a well-resourced treasury that are looking at things closely are going to either come down on being able to be clear about where the line is and see what should stay outside because it's only got incidental usages that might look a little bit financial service-ish or say a whole lot of these things are in, but here's a clear pathway to compliance and a grandfathering regime to get them in there in a way that actually works. Because if people just leave the jurisdiction and endows, you know, in fairness, those might not be able to be fixed under the current round of um, reforms, but we will hopefully see a whole lot of things get fixed that'll help keep the jobs um, and businesses here so that regulators can ensure those jobs and businesses here are dealing with, cu with customers and consumers in a way where their standards met and rules that can give people a fair outcome and they're not dealing with offshore operators. Um, you know, we saw last year, many of those businesses that collapsed were operating out of um, sunny, sandy places with, with um, welcoming regulatory frameworks, but nearly impossible for someone as a private citizen to bring a claim or a meaningful complaint because of the nature of that international um, access. And we don't want to see a situation where Australians are forced into, into more international access um, and deprived of the, of what should be some standards and benefits that, you know, well-meaning and proper businesses here want to do. So there's definitely a desire inside the business, inside the whole blockchain industry to be compliant and be able to meet those standards to compete against those who aren't offering those standards overseas. But it's a big still work to be done to get here. And I think everyone at this panel is probably working hard, largely pro bono, to help the government try and get there. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's good. I'm just conscious of time. So, Jamie, maybe if you have any anything further doubt on that. And if not, I have a question about insurance, getting insurance. And if you've had any work there. I don't have anything to add. I mean, Michael pretty much covered everything that I would have said. So I don't think I have any meaningful additional value on that particular point. Okay. And Simon? 
I, I was only going to say what Michael said so well. I, I guess you know the regulatory certainty helps us help our clients. Um, when the goalposts keep changing in different jurisdictions, what might be relevant for a for an advice now will be different later. Um, so you know, certainly encourage that for you. Okay, um, we've got about five minutes, but maybe There's a couple of questions. I think. Yep. Okay. Let's do that. Okay. Can we see them? Um, is there a legal protocol where a metric indicates the go stop decision around establishing a DAO? Joni, it's probably for you. I can't see the question. Can you just repeat it again? Is there a protocol where a metric indicates the go stop decision around establishing a DAO? I don't know that there's the, the way I in, interpret the question is that um, is there a way of getting a tick, a green tick, to say that your model of decentralised governance is going to allow you to be um, afforded distinct legal personality and limited liability? And the, quest, that, the answer to that at a high level is no, because DAOs do not... Um, no matter how good your model of decentralized governance is, if you don't have any registration, then you're either an unincorporated association of persons or a partnership. Um, there's, there's a third argument to say you're an illegal thing beyond the operation of law, but I don't tend to like that third argument because you'll always get squeezed into one bucket if an enforcement action comes. So um, there are protocols such as CaliDAO, K-A-L-I, that are, uh, again, mostly from a US perspective, trying to allow you to take, it takes you through a workflow, but it's really just um, generating the basic documents required for a Delaware LLC, member-managed LLC incorporation. And that allows uh, an LLC to be very flexible in writing its bylaws and, and that's where you can have the freedom to define your method of governance. And, and that might be very good or very bad, but um, there could still be a financial pro product offered or, or a security for US purposes for which if you don't have the relevant registration or other disclosure documents or relevant skills, experience and resources as the regulations require, you could still fall foul of the other legal requirements beyond uh, what company incorporation law requires. And, on that note, I would just say the big disclaimer, this is not legal, tax, financial, any other kind of advice for information and educational purposes only. We're not your lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Last one. This is I, I, from Lance Michele. How does a trade fin open a bank account for a DAO or do they? I don't, don't think they could in this country because to open a bank account, you've got to go through the know your customer procedures for anti-money laundering legislation. Um, I, I know I've had uh, foreign companies who just want to open a bank account here as part of getting an Australian financial services license. And that is a hard enough process because you've got to validate um, the owners and the any, any beneficial owners and so forth through the, the shareholding structure um, to get a bank account open. So I, I would hazard that a DAO can't open a bank account. Um, it's a slightly irrelevant question anyway, because uh, as far as I'm aware, most crypto businesses can't open a bank account in this country, um, even if they are <laughs> a legal structure, um, because the banks have been systematically debanking any sort of business that has any tangential connection to cryptocurrency at all. Right, thanks. Yeah, I think, I think in theory, you might have someone who's acting as a sort of trustee on behalf of DAO members. But again, to Jamie's point, the, the theory is fine. But the practicality of if you turn up the bank and say, hi, I'm doing this on behalf of a whole bunch of people who I don't know, um, becomes problematic. Uh, certainly, if you're going in and opening a bank account as a trustee of a trust, they'll want to see the trust deed. But in DAO circumstances, even if there was a constitution, which there probably won't be, but if there was, even that's just not going to be recognizable. So it'll be it will be nearly impossible um, for that to occur. I am aware historically of some businesses that have tried to avoid the debanking problem by opening bank accounts in employee names, um, which is also an issue for Dow because I don't have an employee uh, without being 100% honest about the use and the purpose of that bank account. 
Um, and I'm certainly not endorsing <laughs> that approach uh, and it carries any number of legal risks with it, uh, along with the fact that the entity to whom the money actually belongs may not have legal recourse to it if it's in a bank account with the, on somebody else's name. Um, but I'm aware that that is a practice that has taken place in the industry um, to try and bank businesses that otherwise face challenges. Um, but it is an ongoing issue that's a subject of consultation uh, because legitimate businesses right now can't open bank accounts, much less DAOs. Okay, we might have to call it there. And I just want to thank each of you. And for those listening, I've spent a few hours with these people over the last month, and we could probably do a whole day on this stuff. And there's a lot, lot to unpick. Um, we'll have to think about blockchain week and <laughs> make sure we have enough time allocated. But but thank you. Uh, I might just give a quick rundown of the day for two minutes, just for those who weren't there the whole time, because it's been quite an interesting day. We started with the ACCC talking about the number of scams that are up this year from last year. It's a, you know something between a 40 to 50% increase. Many are old crimes using new technology. Uh, they did say there's been a switch from certain accents to using British accents to, because people are more trusting of British accents. <laughs> so if anybody calls you with a British accent, don't trust them at all. Um, Really interesting, and I've seen, I, I can see this coming myself. AI, the combination of AI use, being used to fool people, and then crypto making it easy to get their money is gonna be a real problem. And, and you know, it, everyone needs to be thinking about how we solve that problem. Uh, interestingly though, we did talk to a couple of groups who do chain monitoring, and the ability with, with these open source decentralized networks is they're not tracking it. They can see money going to particular wallets and they can track it. And some of that's now being trapped in places where people are going to find it difficult to get out. So in some ways, you know, decentralized networks are part of the solution. Um, we then had a really good uh, update from Block and what they're doing and thinking about identity and how they're working with the global players to and uh, identify protocols and standards so that we can really get to a, a self-sovereign ID. And that will once again facilitate to, uh, you know, us getting a better security posture across, across the ecosystems. Common theme of the day, we need to ed educate the regulators. You know, innovation is always going to move faster than the regulators can. And we need to make sure we're taking the regulators on journey with us, that we're not... Um, being mad at them later for not finding the bugs and then being mad about being overregulated. If we take them on the journey, we're likely going to get a better outcome. Uh, I think we've solved the problem of custody in a lot of ways for individuals, you know, have manage your own keys, there's wallets and things. I think the discussion around institutional solutions and institutional regulation still has a ways to go. And there was a really good discussion today about you know, that next round of consultation on that and where we get to in our terms of being able to deal with it at an institutional level, wholesale level. Um, and I just finish by saying this, what, what it comes out to me is there's a lot of really great stuff happening in Australia with really good companies in Australia and some very bright people in our ecosystem. And we need to make sure we, we support that and keep that growing. And I think what you've seen here on this panel is that we have some of the legal leading minds in the world who are helping not just people in Australia, but people globally to evolve this landscape. And we should leverage that uh, to the maximum amount we can. And with that, I will close this session and that update. And Michael, I will hand it to you to close the day. Thanks so much, Gordon. And thanks very much for the other panelists in this final panel of the day. Again, thanks to the folks who've, who've hung around all, all day today. I think there's been a huge amount of really interesting learnings. I think some things have been tweeted out as have gone through the day on Twitter. Uh, I wanted to thank everyone who's been involved in making all of the hard work behind the scenes look easy. I assure you there's a huge amount of hard work that goes into all of this. Even just um, rounding up and making sure all the LinkedIn links for uh, the speakers are going out to attendees to see all those is is no small small order. And so certainly, um, Gordon and Amy Rose and Mary Lee Lewis um, and everyone involved in Blockchain Australia has worked really hard to, to make all this happen. So really appreciate everyone's time. Hope you've got some excellent learnings. Please reach out to various speakers who've been on today. Um, directly on LinkedIn is usually a great way um, to do it. I think we've also got 
a special LinkedIn post to connect with the panelists. So please feel free to jump in there. Um, it's really important, of course, you know, security. And I think I, sh I share Gordon's concerns while just this morning while I was looking up a little business day calculator, of course, immediately underneath was some ad claiming that Koshi had endorsed some cryptocurrency thing and, and scams only continue to rise and AI was only going to make it worse by making it cheaper and faster to push out um, clickbaity com content, which is a, a scary thing. So there's a lot of really big challenges coming and uh, many of us will have to work really hard to help help everyone get through and have and have better outcomes as we travel. But the, if days like today are really important steps along that journey. And uh, it's really great to see such a great community of people turning out. And also thank you for everyone who's been putting in questions to all the panelists, uh, putting them on the spot or otherwise getting your just, um, specific query answered. Stay tuned for more information coming on Blockchain Week, which we're all very excited to have at the end of June um, this year. It's uh, looking like it's going to be fantastic, just like it was last year. So. If, again, if you want to get involved with anything with Blockchain Australia, you know um, our domain, please reach out with the panelists in the meantime. And otherwise, thank you very much. We'll formally close today's proceedings.